Good day, everybody. About three devotionals ago, I touched on how Moses asked God, If I have found favour in your sight, please show me your ways. And God did that. Because we read in Psalm 103, verse 7, God made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Thereafter, I shared on Prophet Elijah, feeling discouraged and defeated, and how God revealed himself to Elijah in a low whisper, in a still small voice. Last week, I shared on how Prophet Elisha's servant panicked when he saw the Syrian army surrounding them, and how Elisha prayed that God would open the eyes of his servant. When God answered that prayer, Elisha's servant saw God's army with horses and chariots of fire surrounding their enemies. It's so important to ask God to give us clear spiritual vision. Today, we'll look at how Jesus is revealed in the midst of our trials. You're probably very familiar with the account of Jesus walking on water. This is one of Jesus's most well-known miracles. Even many non-believers have heard of this. And this passage is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. And this is after Jesus had miraculously fed 5,000 men with just two lo five loaves of bread and two fish. Let me read the passage, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, immediately after the miracle and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them, walking on the sea, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, many times we see the word immediately, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of Peter, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. As I said, you know this story well. And you know that the disciples were in the will of God, yet they found themselves in a storm. Too many of us, whenever we face difficulties in life, we try to find out what caused this difficulty. What caused the storm? We question if we are outside of God's will or if we are being disciplined for our sin. Now, we have all been conditioned to associate trials with sin and disobedience. And to be sure, disobedience does bring us into storms. But this verse says you can be doing exactly what God wants you to do and be exactly where God wants you to be and still find yourself in a big storm. Why does God sometimes send us into storms? So that we will be trained in Christ-likeness. Also, very often, when things are calm and going well, we cannot hear God at all. And God has to call us to get an appointment to meet with us. But when the storms are raging, you find yourself down on your knees, fasting even, I often see people we don't regularly see at church suddenly showing up for prayer meetings. But I'm not one to judge them because I've been in those shoes myself. So yes, 
sometimes God does send us into hardship in order to be able to talk to us. The disciples were terrified when they first saw Jesus walking on the water. And some skeptics say that Jesus was wading along the shore in shallow water. But verse 24 says, the disciples were in the boat and it was a long way from land. The disciples concluded it is a ghost that they are seeing. But they had been with Jesus every day. They had just witnessed him performing an unbelievable miracle, feeding 5,000 men with just five loaves and two fish and ending up with 12 baskets of leftovers. But they couldn't recognize Jesus in the storm. There's a lesson in this. We can be so focused fighting the storm that we cannot recognize God. And Jesus spoke words of comfort. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. It is I is translated in many places within scripture as I am. The name I am is the eternal identification of God. It is what God said to Moses, I am who I am. And Jesus told the disciples, take heart, it is I, it is I am. God is here. Now all of us, when we are in a storm, have to look through the storm until we can sense the presence of God and we hear his comforting and confident voice saying, take courage, I am here. But Jesus has more in mind than just comforting his disciples. Jesus sought to perfect their faith. Jesus sought to reveal himself to them. Now, rather characteristically, the brash and impulsive apostle Peter he pierced through the darkness of the storm and the spray of all that sea water, and he calls out to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. There's both curiosity and bold faith mixed in Peter's request. Basically, he's saying, since it is you, just command me to get to you. And, Peter, and Jesus gives Peter a simple one-word command, come. Peter then swings his legs over the edge of the rolling boat. He dangles them above the swirling sea, the tossing waves. I certainly couldn't have done what Peter did. It takes tremendous courage even to get close to the edge of a fishing boat in a storm. Imagine stepping out of the boat and onto the water. None of the other disciples ventured to do that. But Peter was filled with faith. There was a surge of faith. And I have no doubt he pleased Jesus with his request. Because the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, in the purest sense, Peter did not rest his weight on the water. But he rested on the command of Jesus, come. Peter trusted that if Jesus told him to do the impossible, even to walk on water, then it can be done. With his eyes fixed on Jesus, he steps out. And incredibly, he stands steady. And he begins to walk on the swirling waves toward Jesus. But moments later, Peter's faith faltered. He began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, being a fisherman, Peter certainly knew how to swim. But now, despite trying every stroke he could think of, freestyle, butterfly, backstroke, he sank. Because of doubt and fear, he used his eyes to judge the circumstances and he sank. I found that in a storm, God will reveal to me that whatever I've considered an anchor an anchor to my life will not save me and may actually cause me to sink further. Then Peter, Jesus immediately reached out his hand to hold Peter. Now what's extraordinary is that Jesus did not commend or congratulate Peter for that brief episode of mammoth faith, 
But Jesus actually rebuked him. Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? We would have expected Jesus to praise and encourage Peter. That's what we would have done, right? Peter, that was really great effort. Tia you, you're the best of the 12. Don't give up, okay? Next time you will do better. That's what we will probably say. But Jesus didn't offer that kind of encouragement. He asked him, Why did you doubt? You have little faith. Now, was Jesus angry? No, Jesus wasn't angry. But Jesus wanted Peter's faith and our faith to be perfected. Because an initial search of faith in the storm is not enough. Sometimes when we go through a storm, the first two weeks we are like on fire. We are like encouraging ourselves with all the promises of God. But then suddenly, we find ourselves without hope. So, an initial search of faith is not enough. We all need sustained, sustainable or sustained faith. And when Peter stepped out of the boat, he was standing on the identity and the faithfulness of Jesus. But in, the light, in light of the stormy conditions, he soon, forget, he soon forgot that. So Peter, Jesus held on to Peter and saved him. How did they get into the boat? No answer is given in the Bible. But look carefully at verse 32. The wind, the storm didn't stop until after Jesus and Peter got into the boat. Our problem is that we want God to stop the storm first and then save us. We think that's the requirement. God, you have to stop the storm. That's how I will know you are saving me. But God can come in the midst of the storm and walk with you right through your storm. Last point, the disciples worshipped him and said, truly, you are the Son of God. Their eyes were open now. They have a divine revelation. The storm helped them to see Jesus in the correct light, that he is not just a friend, he is not just a rabbi, but he is God. Shall we all now look to God in prayer? Thank you, God, for this story. There's so many learning points for us. God, I thank you that we don't have to always blame ourselves for storms that we encounter, but we can trust that you're going to walk with us through the storm. And I thank you, God, that Peter walking on water was not to demonstrate the greatness or the weakness of his faith, but it was to demonstrate the greatness of your saving grace. And I thank you, God, that you are with us. And truly, Jesus, you are God. You are Lord, we confess that. Thank you, Lord, for helping us every day. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.